ready to start. So um, thank you very much for coming and joining the Conservative Society here at the LNC. I'm going to very quickly hand over to Professor Tony Travers, who will be chairing tonight. Um, thank you very much for joining. trade. 
they can do winners and losers. But on a, <coughs> this single market is very beneficial for British business and British jobs, and good for the jobs that you will ultimately get. It's not finished. Um, it's not a complete single market. It's actually optimized for the German economy. It's optimized for goods rather than services. But there's a lot in the pipeline in services, which is where Britain excels. Things like the internet, capital markets, professional services, etc. And as Britain, as the second largest economy in the EU, and maybe in a generation the largest economy, is well positioned to influence and lead that single market. Of course, provided we stay in. Now, we're not in the Eurozone, which is also part of the EU, and which is, frankly, a bit of a disaster. But we have the best of both worlds. In the single market, not in the Euro. One of the most controversial elements about these four freedoms is the free movement of people. I don't know what Richard will say, but some of his friends think that that's a disaster. I think it's pretty good. Not only do we get to have talented people coming into Britain, often they've been educated at foreign government's expense. They come here, they have higher employment rates than the native population, they pay their taxes, and often they're not so old that they're a drain on the National Health Service. But we also have the freedom to live, work, retire. We have a lot of Brits retiring in the southern part of Europe. One of the problems with the case of for leaving the EU is what does out look like? What sort of out do they want? Frankly, it's a leap in the dark. There's no good model. Any model would involve either reasonably full access to the single market, but having to follow all the rules of the single market without a vote on them, which would involve a loss of control rather than a gain of control, or it would involve losing partial access to the single market. What's more, the process of leaving would be a messy process. It could become acrimonious. Even if it wasn't acrimonious, it would be long drawn out. That would increase uncertainty. That would be bad for business and jobs, perhaps just at the time that you are leaving university and looking for jobs. <coughs> Second main reason for staying in the EU is influence and security. We live in a dangerous world. We are an island, but we're not an island in another sense. To the east, you've got Putin flexing his muscles. To the south, you've got <coughs> North Africa and the Middle East blowing up. We are going to be better able to influence our neighborhood and to stabilize the situation by working together with our partners in Europe. What's more, looking to the future, Britain is well positioned to be a leader in EU foreign policy. We have, along with the French, the strongest armed forces in Europe. We have a position on the Security Council of the UN, a permanent position with a veto, and we have hundreds of years of diplomatic expertise. We are good. We have made 13,000 treaties since 1834. We are good at making alliances in our interest, and the most important alliance we have at the moment is in the EU, and we are well positioned to be the leader there. The final point I wanted to make was Scotland. If we leave the EU, it's highly likely that the Scots will have voted to stay in the EU, and they will demand another referendum on leaving the UK. Now, they would be, in my view, ill-advised to leave the UK because it would be economically silly for them to do so, but they might well take that opportunity if they're given it a second time. And that would, again, be something which would diminish the UK as a whole. I rest my case.
Thank you very much indeed, Tony. My name is Richard Tice. I'm co-chair of the main LEAD campaign, LEAD.EU. I'm also a real estate entrepreneur and was the former CEO of a FTSE 250 multinational business. Now let's be very clear, I'm going to pick up some of uh, Hugo's points um, and we'll perhaps talk about Scotland as a sort of separate question later. Um, I'm going to deal with prosperity and I'm going to deal with security. But let's be clear, we love Europe, we want to leave the European Union. One is a wonderful geographic area, the other is a bureaucratic, undemocratic elite. Now, it's not a leap in the dark to leave, it's a stride into the sunshine of freedom. There's a massive difference. We will be free to negotiate our own trade deals with countries all over the world, including our Commonwealth partners. <coughs> we'll be free to control our own laws and our own borders, and I'll go into those uh, a bit later. But at the moment, we export to the European Union somewhere in the mid-30s of our, all our exports when you strip out what's called the Rotterdam effect. The rest of our exports goes to the rest of the world, and those are growing fast, while sadly, our exports to the European Union are going, frankly, nowhere. We're exporting less to the EU than we exported 10 years ago. When we leave, we can negotiate our own free trade agreements. Take India, for example, Commonwealth partner. The EU's been trying to negotiate a trade agreement with India for eight years and got nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. We'll have more influence on the world stage because we will regain our seat on the World Trade Organization, regain our seat on a thing called UNIS and CODEX. They are the trade standard bodies that sit above the European Union. They set most of the international trade standard now, not the EU, that actually just rubber stamps them and charges a very high price for doing so. Now, only 5% of UK businesses export to the European Union. And yet 100% of UK businesses suffer the costs, which runs into the tens, if not hundreds of billions of pounds every single year. And that's totally unnecessary, because there's over 150 other countries around the world that can export to the European Union. Yes, of course, when you export to the EU, you, you uh, comply with EU standards. But if you're not exporting, if you're a domestic business, why do you need to comply with, frankly, numerous daft rules and regulations? We have nothing to fear. And now more and more big businesses, recently, Toyota, Unilever, Vauxhall, Nissan, JCB, have all come out and said, actually, do you know what? It wouldn't make any difference to our UK investment plans or our UK jobs. And you hear about the great and the good saying, ah, yes, but it'll be a disaster. The CBI, Goldman Sachs, who some of you no doubt will go and work for, the Financial Times that you probably read online. They all said we should join the Euro 17 years ago, and by Hugo's own admission, frankly, an unmitigated disaster. And let me tell you, I'm going to make a forecast. Within the next five to ten years, at least three countries are going to have to exit the Euro. And you talk about messy, that is going to be seriously messy. We have huge negotiating leverage to negotiate a new deal. After all, the EU27 exports every year over £60 billion more to us than we export to them. And yet we're paying to be a member of this club. I'm a businessman. If they want to sell more to me than I sell to them, my starting point is they should be paying me, not me paying them a net 12 or 13 billion pounds every year, which frankly equates to some 35 million a day, almost a brand new hospital every single week. They have a legal obligation to negotiate a free trade agreement under a thing called Article 50. So all these myths that three million jobs are going to be lost and we're going to lose all our exports to you, utter scaremongering, nonsense. As the mayor would say, baloney. <laughs> what I also like about leaving the EU is it will bring power back to Westminster, which means that no more can our politicians and our civil servants blame their own incompetence on the EU bureaucrats and elite because we can hold Westminster properly to account. We're the fifth largest in the economy in the world. We're a member of the G8, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. We're the head of the Commonwealth of 2.2 billion people, four times bigger than the European Union. The idea that we're not good enough, we're not big enough, we're not, you know, is utter, utter nonsense. That just shows a lack of confidence and a lack of belief 
And sadly, that's the situation we have with the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary who have not got those attributes for being leaders. So, we have a positive vision. We can truly have a win-win situation. And let me tell you, the biggest risk, ladies and gentlemen, is not leaving. The biggest risk is staying in to an EU that, frankly, is stagnant in terms of economic growth, is responsible for hideous levels of mass youth unemployment across all of the, uh, the EU countries. And if we stay in, Brussels will view it as a joyous mandate. Yes, more regulations, more centralisation. The Brits, they can pay ever higher contributions. Fantastic. More restrictions on the City of London. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, the secret agenda of people like Ken Clark, Lord Manders, Martin Sorrell, Richard Branson, their secret agenda is that we should still join the euro to try and prop it up. Ladies and gentlemen, that would be an absolute disaster. So we can have a win-win by leaving the European Union, opening our eyes to the rest of the world, but still trading and enjoying the benefits of the countries of Europe. Mm -hmm. I rest my case. Thank you very much. Do you want to, do you want to come back? Oh, right. Should we debate this one? Right, fine. Right, OK, very good. Don't change the OK, very good. Well, really <laughs> I'm going to open this up almost immediately. And I just want to have one sharp question of my own. To really, just to go. Um, what you go, I mean, you say our voice in your life. The truth is, for anybody aged more than over 43, which is encouragingly about half the population, and you can vote in, they lived in Britain or the Indian Union. Really. Seemed to function perfectly well. Uh, you know, it wasn't uh, in a bad position there. It was democratic. And what, what, I mean, so to say, uh, what does it look like? Many older voters know what it looks like. It's what it was. But you can't turn the clock back. No, no, 43 saying, years, yeah. um, you have to turn the clock forward. And the question, I, that, I would say, what does it look like? What does it look like economically? Mm -hmm. So um, do you want to stay in the single market, or do you not want to stay in the single market? Boris Johnson was interviewed by Andrew Marr on Sunday on the BBC, and he was all over the place on this issue. So you have to decide what you want to be. Do you want to be in the single market? If you want to be in the single market, which would, which would mean you have full access, actually where Richard's wrong, it's 44% of our exports go to the EU. Um, then... Richard's right, it's four. Well, no, it's, I mean, he's wrong about that. No, no, it's, it's falling as a percentage. It's falling as a percentage of okay. our exports. It's not falling in absolute terms. It's okay. going up. Okay. No, but... Less than it was in 2006. It's not, actually. It's up. We can, we can, we can, I can show you some statistics on that. You can probably read him down hand and get some statistics wrong. Um, the, so that's the, that's, that's, the first, that's the first thing. The second, the second thing is you don't have to say, so, so if, if you're going to be in the single market, in, some Eurosceptics say they'd like to be like Norway in the single market. If we were like Norway, we would have basically in the single market but we would not have a vote on the laws of the single market. And also, the Norwegians pay as much net per person per year as we do, which is about £100 per person per year. Uh, Richard's wrong. He gave you, when he gave you that so-called net figure for what we send, he actually gave you the gross figure. The net figure is about half that. No, it is. No, it's not. No, it's, 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 it's um, if you don't want to, you don't want to be in the single market, you lose partial access to the single market. And no country which is not in the single market has full access for its financial services industry, which is our most important industry, um, our largest industry. It's about 10% of the economy. We have what's known as a passport. A passport means that any financial firm based in London can offer, or in the UK, can offer its services right across. So what his side needs to do is they need to be able to tell us what do they want. Do they want in, in which case we're going to have to follow all these rules without a vote on them, that doesn't seem an advance enough reason, or does he want to be out? And if he wants to be out, that's fine, but then we're going to suffer an economic consequence. Okay, right, very good. I'm sure others will want to come back to that. I just want you, I'll, don't want to respond to him immediately, just wait till the other questions come out, ask you a slightly different question, which is,
about immigration. And Hugo hinted at this. At some level, isn't the uh, Me campaign in part responding to high levels of immigration? And if Britain leaving the EU were to be followed by a substantial reduction in immigration, wouldn't that mean that people in Britain who are used to traveling to Europe rather easily would suddenly find themselves, and to put it at the extreme case, having to get a visa to go to Germany, let us say? Again, um, makes a good headline, utterly nonsense, wrong, pure myths. Let's talk about immigration. The UK has always been wonderfully welcoming of immigrants, certainly since the Second World War. And immigration is a good thing for an economy. And we want to welcome on the Leave side the best talent, the best global talent from around the world. But you want, you want, you, we want to uh, welcome the right quantity and the right quality so that it can help our economy without being a burden. Because what you have at the moment is uncontrolled chaotic immigration, which is a burden on housing up and down the country, on GP ser services, health, education, and infrastructure up and down the country. Because the truth is, the real levels of immigration in this country are between two and three times the official government statistics. So immigration can be a positive, but you have to do it on a sensible, controlled basis. So we're very positive about immigration. Um, and what was your... That was the only one that I just wanted to... Let me just press you a bit on that then, press you a bit, because I can see that, but in order to come up with a system of the kind you described, wouldn't it mean that for a number of countries where the, Brit the British currently have easy rights to travel, there would have to be restrictions? And if there were restrictions, wouldn't that then lead those countries to impose restrictions? The simple answer is Switzerland. There are no restrictions on travelling through Switzerland. Switzerland is not a member of the EU. You know, it's just utter nonsense. Everywhere, every airport you go through, you see the sort of the, the flag of the EU with the stars, and then it says underneath, including Switzerland. And that's all that will happen. It's so easy. But these myths build and, and they the need Swiss to offer, The Swiss offer free movement to people. Um, Which they're people required to reject. Yes, but they're required to do that in order to get part of uh, access to large chunks of the single market. Um, a lot of people on your side, and I think you in, 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 actually now, were basically saying you didn't want to have free movement. No, I'm saying we welcome immigration, but you have to but be you able don't to want free movement. You, you, you don't, don't want someone from Germany or Greece or Italy to have the right need, to come to Britain. You don't need free movement in order to trade with countries. No, but you told me lots of countries export. Which does have free movement. All right, very good. Now, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, ask a question of one or other of the, um, uh, one side or the other. Keep it short is all I'd ask, so we get plenty of opportunities for everybody who wants to have a say. If you'd like to have go first, then write. Do say your name if you want, but don't if you don't. Uh, one hand here, one at the back, you can say three at a time is all I'd ask. Go on. So thank you. Now that the Swiss have had a referendum on halting the free movement of people, how do you think that will interact with the European Union? I'll just deconstruct that for oh, me as a chair, um, no, it's my problem. Oh, sorry. Um, Everybody else will understand it, but not me. Uh, the Swiss have had a referendum on the free movement of people yes. where they've said they wanted to halt it. How do you think the EU will react to that? They rejected it. They re yes. Oh, sorry. I think they did, re they, they reversed yeah. it. Sorry. They reversed it. I think they did reverse it, didn't they? Is that right? They, they, they rejected, they rejected, they rejected it. it. And so, you know, you've got a bit of a standing round. But I just come to this point. Hang on, let me take the other two. Okay, come, sorry. No, yep. no, 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 just for efficiency's sake. Sure. Britain's a permanent member of the UN Security Council. It's um, the fifth largest economy. Surely those are reasons to leave the EU because that means that 
That means that if we stay in the EU, you believe that Britain's not good enough to be on its own. And bearing in mind that countries like um, Canada and Australia, they're not part of the single market, um, but they're doing rather well, even though they're the 11th and 12th largest economies. And um, secondly to Richard, um, I'm a massive Eurosceptic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as we have brought up our previous question. Thank you However, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about leave.eu's um, focus on um, immigration. I know Aaron Banks said that um, it plans to um, put immigration at the forefront of the campaign. Um, there has been um, research showing that moderate voters aren't likely to be swamped by immigration. So, um, how can you? Um, so, do you still plan to um, make immigration the focus of the campaign, or do you plan to um, use other arguments as well? Because I think it should be mentioned. Um, it should be mentioned in passing, but it shouldn't be the main argument. Okay, we've got three points there. Responses to the Swiss situation, as it turned out, the loveless marriage. <laughs> And the two questions, you go. What about the okay? Okay, dogs? the Swiss situation is that they, they they voted to put an end to free movement of people, um, but it hasn't been put into practice yet. They have until next year to put it into practice. The EU said that if you do put it into practice, um, you're going to lose partial access to the single market because um, all of these things actually are tied together. And in, in one of the things that they'll lose access to is research programs, another is student exchanges, I mean, sorts of things that, um, but, but more than that too. Um, and it may well be that the Swiss overturned their decision. Second, about the loveless marriage, um, well, you have to look at every, every situation as it is. There are, some, if it, there are some marriages which people are better off divorcing in, and there are some marriages because nothing in the world is perfect. No relationship is perfect. There are some situations where you're best um, actually working at it, sticking at it, and rather than just throwing um, everything up into the air. Um, if you believed um, in a loveless marriage, that if you believed that if you got out of a marriage, you were just going to be on your own um, forever and ever, you might think that it's better to be in a marriage. Um, I never said that Britain was not good enough. I think Britain is a great country. I think it has a strong economy, and it has a strong diplomatic and um, fairly strong, although weakened, military capability. Um, these are things that I mentioned when I made my introductory comments. My point, rather, is that we can become an even greater Britain by operating within the EU, operating with our allies in a dangerous neighborhood which, frankly, Canada and Australia are not in dangerous neighbourhoods. Richard, about immigration and back So, to I think the, the point about immigration is uh, polling shows that at the moment, up and down the country, it is the number one concern of British people for the reasons that I meant about the pressure that it is creating on public services and communities. And we say on Leave.eu, we've got to address that issue. And the only way of addressing it is by leaving the European Union. And, and the real point is that actually there are lots of countries around the world that export to the European Union, China, Australia, <coughs> um, Canada. They don't have free movement of people. You don't have to have free movement of people in order to trade with other nations. It's as simple as that. So there, but there are lots of uh, other points that we are uh, focusing on within our campaign. You know, we're hugely positive. The UK is doing okay. Oh, you know, if we're, we're doing okay. And the reason we're doing okay is not thanks to the European Union. It's in spite of it. It's because we work hard, we've got a fantastic uh, transparent legal system, property market, the City of London, we've got all those benefits. But the, the European Union is actually holding us back. We can be the fourth largest economy in the world within the next 15 to 20 years. I'm boring you, so I'm very sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> right now. I was, I was wondering how Richard would respond to the Boris Johnson argument that perhaps three years after an out we could go back in again and do some sort of re-entry to the European Union.
uh, coming to the UK and staying with benefits by being in the EU. Good. And that was actually my question as well. <laughs> 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 well that's the one. I mean, as, as an international, I could say that we, we like we like investing in Britain because I mean we're the third largest investor in Britain. We because of their links to the continent, and you know we have these cultural and linguistic similarities. But I really wouldn't underestimate our ability to learn French or German. essentially turned its back on the Commonwealth <coughs> in favour of joining the EU. Australia felt abandoned. And it, so that was a very interesting observation. So I mean, you know, different people have different views. But I just think it's absolutely ridiculous that we haven't got a free trade agreement with India. I mean, you know, <coughs> it's a fantastic partner. It's the biggest democracy in the world. It's got huge potential. You know, probably more potential now than China. And we're not able to deliver that. It's by leaving. The UK can negotiate a free trade agreement with, uh, with India, probably within 12 months. And even if it's not perfect, even if it doesn't cover everything, it'll be significantly better than it is now. So of course, great that um, you can learn whatever your language, that's fantastic. But I just think um, the transparency, the legal system, um, the quality of uh, the environment here, the culture in London, the opportunities here will be the greatest. And that's why I think uh, you know, Indians will continue to invest. Okay. Can I, 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 Mehindi Bona Chata. And so I think we should also learn to speak Hindi. But um, I, I just want to say, first of all, that one of the reasons why it's difficult to do a free trade deal with India is because, particularly in services, which is an area that we're very keen on, that Indians are extremely protectionist. Um, the idea that we're going to go out there and negotiate lots and lots of free trade deals. Um, Yes, we will, but it will take us time. The first thing you have to remember is that the EU has already signed over 50 free trade deals. If we leave the EU, we will not have access to those 50 trade deals. So we'll have to be starting from behind just to get back to where we were before. Then the idea, okay, we're going to go to India, we're going to go to you know, um, Australia, we're going to go to China, we're going to go whatever it is. We will, the big one, outside of course doing a free trade deal with is America. But the American um, trade representative has already made clear in an interview with Reuters last year that America wouldn't be keen to do a deal with us. Now, I think ultimately they would do a deal with us, but they certainly wouldn't be keen. We wouldn't be front of the queue, we'd be back of the queue. And the big one would be the EU trade deal. Richard is right. We can do a free trade deal with the EU without free movement of people, but it will not be a deep free trade deal. Also, where he's wrong, though, is to suggest that the EU would be desperate to do a deal with us. He keeps on coming, all the Eurosceptics that come up with this idea, they sell more to us than we sell to them. What they don't understand, or what, what they don't tell you, maybe they understand it without telling you, it's even worse, is that 12% of our GDP is exports to the rest of the EU, whereas only 3% of their GDP is exports to us. They totally ignored the proportionality. And because of that proportionality, we would be the ones who would be desperate to do the deal, not them. Solidly, <laughs> uh, I, respond to that. I think I'm going to pick up on the proportionality point. Because
because percentages all sounds very good. But these are human lives we're talking about. There are, there are 3 million jobs in the UK involved in exports to the EU. In the European Union, there are 6 million jobs involved in trade with the UK. And the EU is the place. The EU 27 is the one with a massive unemployment crisis, particularly amongst the young. So, um, I mean, maybe Hugo's suggesting that actually humans don't matter, it's percentages that matter, or the youth don't matter, um, it's percentages. But uh, I think proportionality is, is just nonsense. It's about, um, it, it's about the quantity of people. That's the key point. Um, let's just pick up this, uh, this issue of sort of free trade agreements. The US. The trade representative in the US used to work in Brussels, as did his wife. I mean, come on. You know, who's paying the bills here? Um, oh, if the US, on. come on. Well, if, the US, if the US, if the US saw a free trade agreement, if the US saw a free trade agreement with Oman, of course he's going to want a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom. And if Iceland, with 300,000 people, can negotiate a free trade agreement with China, I'm quite sure the UK with 65 people <coughs> can negotiate a free trade agreement with other countries around the world. So, and, and I'm going to pick up on this point about services, because everybody says it's fantastic, the services and passport. You talk to Terry Smith, you've probably heard of Terry Smith, he's, he's a fantastic city fund manager who runs Fundsmith. Passporting doesn't work. He launches, he tries to sell his funds all over the EU. He has to re-register it and get it regulated in every single country. It's a myth. Right. Do you want to respond to that? And then I'm going to ask the audience for more responses. Well, to passporting passporting um, is of interest to large parts of the city, but I have to admit it's not of so much interest to people in fund management. But um, that is only a small portion of our financial services. Okay. As far as as far as China and Iceland is concerned, I must say I haven't looked into the detail of the China Iceland deal, but I have looked into the detail of the China Switzerland deal, which is often mentioned, and they're part of the same group with with Iceland, and it's an extremely unbalanced deal. What it consisted of was that the Swiss opened their market to Chinese goods immediately, no tariffs, no tariffs on that, whereas the Chinese phased in the um, reduction of tariffs on Swiss goods over a 14-year period. Now, there were some that were allowed in immediately, some products that the Chinese were not actually producing domestically, like cooking clocks. <laughs> but I don't think that we want to get into a similar unbalanced negotiation with the Chinese. When it's the whole EU negotiating with the Chinese, we're going to be strong. If it's us on our own, we will not be as strong. All right, I'm going to go back to the audience now to take two or three points. Um, I'll go to this side of the audience. So one, two, three, and then I'll come to the back in a second. One, two. Okay, hi, uh, Florian, and I'm an active supporter of the European Continental Movement for the Brexit, so I'm also not afraid to talk about uh, migration, because I think you have talked about it for some time already. There's a huge influx of uh, British migrants to the continent. You have mentioned the people retired in Spain, exploiting the social security systems, the hospitals in Spain. There's areas in Poland where there's almost no plumbers left. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I thank you very much for your engagement, um, for your selfless uh, proposal to leave the European Union, to help the European cause. But I want to ask you, what can you tell these concerned European citizens that are worried about their social security systems that are exploited by British migrants? Come back to that. <laughs> 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 From the furthest and most interesting quarter of the left field this evening. So, no, yeah. Just very quickly, I would like to add to that that uh, British migrants to the continent are reportedly often very drunk and aggressive and don't want to integrate into the respective country. For example, uh, the retired Brits that moved to Spain don't speak Spanish. So what do you say to Maria, who's 80 years old and worked hard her entire life and is afraid of going outside because of drunk Brits that don't speak Spanish? Okay, right, thank you. And <coughs> here at LSE, and, and I signed my first working contract ever, 
and I'll start hopefully in July working here in London. Um, so I love this country and it saddens me that so many people want to leave the EU. My question for Hugo is the, the feeling that I have in general, broadly speaking, is business is pro-Europe, but the people are anti-Europe. And if I consider just the city of London, how few British citizens actually work in the city and how many European nationals work in the city who are not allowed to vote. Um, I don't see that the, the, business, the, the, the business voice that, that is pro-Europe translates into a lot of votes. Um, linked to that, the way that Scotland managed to stay here was the debate moved away from simply stating facts and stating fears onto state. The debate moved towards emotional debate. And I don't see this emotional debate of campaigning pro-Europe taking place. I see a lot of, it will take too long to renegotiate all the treaties. Uh, it will be a huge jump into, into the dark. Um, it's like this fear of insecurity that seems to be the main argument to, in the people's mind to vote pro-Europe. Do you address, how, how do you address that? And uh, I'm sorry to take so long. Um, for Richard, you mentioned a lot of people um, I think the British students only make up 20% of uh, LSE's postgraduate student body. Yeah, there are actually more Chinese students uh, here uh, than British postgrads, and we have, we have 400 German students uh, compared to 800 British postgrads. So that includes the Scottish who would like to leave. Um, most of our professors are not British. Uh, they're from Spain, they're from Italy, they're from France, because a lot of British professors teach in the US. Um, and if you say that Britain has done so well in spite of the EU, then I just, don't you think you, you, you sell, you ignore the fact that free movement of labor has helped Britain to prosper, especially has helped London to prosper, um, and uh, that, you, would, you, would you take back this statement uh, that Britain has done so well in spite of the EU, and would you rather we stated in Britain has done so well thanks to the EU? Okay, well, uh, if I can uh, bring a link between those uh, three slightly, sorry, two related, one slightly different questions to the, the wider issue of UK citizens and their right to live abroad and how that would be affected, which is clearly a significant issue as well as some of the uh, uh, broader points that were raised by the questions over here. Um, Richard, you that, that point is incredibly simple to deal with. Under the Vienna Convention of 1969 and Article 70b, anybody with any existing rights under existing treaties will retain those rights. End of. Full stop. So that deals with that point. You're absolutely right about welcoming students, and it's, it's, some of those statistics you mentioned are, are amazing, and that's great. You know, education is one of the UK's greatest exports, and it's an absolute tragedy that we are essentially uh, reducing the number, or indeed preventing in many cases, I believe that the number of uh, Indian students coming to uh, um, learn here has been significantly reduced because of uh, the issues of open borders within the EU. And that's a tragedy because it is true. That was um, quite no, I know, but it's not to say, look, we're not saying we, don't, we want to welcome people, we want to welcome students from all over the world, but this Conservative government has made it much harder. So, you know, that's, that's a key point. And let's be very clear, London was doing very nicely and has continued to do well, but London was doing very well before we had open borders in 2004. So you can still do well, um, but not have uh, completely open borders. The reason people want to come and work uh, in London from all over the world is because it's a fantastic place, and it still will be when we leave. Okay? only protects rights and obligations, quote, created through the execution of the treaty prior to its termination. He says,
says this would probably stop the host country from confiscating a house bought previously, although the Human Convention on Human Rights would probably prevent that anyway. But it is hard to see that they would give Brits any continuing right to be treated as an EU citizen in the years after Brexit when it came to matters such as the rights to work, not to pay extra taxes, to use public health care, to buy further property, or even to carry on living in the host country. So it's not end of story of the Vienna Convention. Um, as far as, of course, these Brits who create a bit of trouble on the continent, of course there are. There's just as there are people anywhere, they're bad eggs. Um, but I think you've got to look in the, in, in, in the broad, you've got to think of all the wonderful cultural exchange. Uh, most people who travel actually give to the places they go to. They bring new ideas, they bring new ways of thinking, they give, um, bring new types of new ways of living, um, new ways of lovemaking even. I mean, this is part of the glorious exchange that we have. And in universities, um, I think it's quite clear that there are, um, you, you, that it's, you're more likely to crack um, cutting edge scientific problems when you have teams that can pull people from across lots of different parts of the world. So I would say, yes, we can make the positive case for cultural, as I think we lost the man who was the German, oh, there he is, um, a half German, half um, Italian. Um, you are, you, you, there you are, you're a mixture of German and Italian, now you've got the British, you've got lots of different things um, which are all coming together and are probably making you a richer, more interesting individual than if you were just focused on one tiny um, gene pool. That's what the, the British people have always been taking people this is wonderful. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, go for it. Okay, right. Um, uh, yes, I'll have well, all the hands at the back gone. I was going to offer questions at the back. They haven't gone now, okay. Just a small point of correct, <coughs> correction for Richard. You said that London was doing really well prior to 2004. Freedom of movement starts in 92 with the Treaty on the European Union. That's 2004. But it may be symptomatic that you mentioned it, because isn't it true that the point of contention about migration nowadays is really about Central Eastern European migrants coming to this country, and they're being semi-skilled or low-skilled, and that's disrupting the uh, social well, dynamic. 2004 was the extension. Yes. So we yeah. were talking about the A8. Uh, yeah. the You're absolutely right, and I should have clarified that. But the truth is that pre-2004, there was very little uh, net uh, migration, whereas post um, it has increased to the levels that we're currently seeing today. So no, you're absolutely right to make that clarification. That's great. Okay, very good. And now, yes, there. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering whether um, this is mainly for Hugo. I was wondering whether you can address the so-called democratic deficit within the EU itself, uh, particularly with regard to the European Commission. You mean that the it's but that is not elected by the not elected under hard to control from inside. I have a question for you, Richard. You mentioned the 5% of businesses that are that export to the EU uh, of British businesses. Maybe Hugo, you can tell us if that figure is all right. Um, what do you say to them? Do you say, hang in there? Uh, we're going to ne negotiate uh, other trade deals and it might take a while, even though they, they risk losing their jobs? OK. Um, Hugo would like to can continue the fact checker, but let's just um, <laughs> right. Um, Can I respond to that? Go on, yes, why don't you? So, the day after we vote to leave, nothing changes. All the existing agreements remain in place until we sign a new one, and we will negotiate. And the, the, the European Commission has accepted that we will negotiate a new agreement. So, it's not as though those jobs are automatically at risk um, the day after. sensible new agreement which will continue trade between the EU27 and the UK. So, I, you know, it's just a pure myth to say all those jobs are at risk. What about these EU institutions, which, I mean, are arguably a bit distant, are they not? It's hard yeah. to, you know... Okay, I mean, what I'm... <coughs> let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me, first of all, accept. Yes, um, they are distant and remote um, to... 
And secondly, there are too many things being done at the EU that could be done at national level. So I would accept those points. What I, what I would say, though, is that the European Commission is not um, undemocratic. Um, these are the commissioners are appointed by democratically elected leaders. In a way, it's a bit like the US cabinet. The president appoints the members of his cabinet. His cabinet members are not directly elected by the US people, um, but not many people would call those faceless bureaucrats. If you look at the other institutions, there are, the, the, the European Commission doesn't actually make law, it makes proposals. There are two bodies that make law. One is the European Parliament. We do elect MEPs. I agree that most of us haven't got a clue who our MEPs are. They are a bit distant and remote, um, but they are elected, so they are democratic, at least in that respect. And then the other group is the Council, the Council of Ministers, and that is made up of representatives sent by national governments. Britain has 13% of the votes in the Council. Coming back to um, Richard's point, um, it's true that the moment that we vote to leave, nothing changes. But the way out of the EU is to trigger Article 50 of the treaty. Um, unless, of course, we were to do what Boris says, or Boris was hinting, which we might vote to leave and then try to stay in on to some sort of new deal. As soon as we trigger Article 50, a clock is ticking. And two years later, if we haven't done a deal, we're out. And at that moment, everything lapses. The 50 trade deals that the EU has done in the rest of the world also our access to the single market. We would have our back to the wall. We probably would negotiate something, but we'd be desperate to do a quick deal, and if you're desperate to do a quick deal in business, and I speak as someone who set up my own company and ran it for 10 years before selling it to Reuters, I can tell you, if you're desperate, you won't do a good deal. down to it would be bad, dangerous, difficult. It's not, this is inherently a wonderful thing, we should stick by it. It's a, it is, so the Scottish, I mean, this goes back to Scotland and the referendum, for those of you who remember that, where there was an emotion to fear um, spectrum there. Do you want to come in on this? No. Um, okay, I'll, I'll get you there, sorry. Okay, well, look, 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 look. Emotion first, of all, emotion, first of all, fear is an emotion. It's a very powerful emotion. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong in campaigners on both sides appealing to all sorts of emotions, um, both fear and hope and um, joy and, and, um, and whatever. Um, what, I, what I do think, though, is that the appeal to those emotions needs to be based on fact. Um, I think that there are lots of things which are justifiable to say we would be putting at risk if we left. There would be a leap into the dark, and we, it, these are things that one is right to fear. The Leave camp, and we've actually heard it um, from Richard t tonight, um, is not afraid to engage in scaremongering. He has said that if we leave, um, there will be nothing to stop the EU coming up with all sorts of new regulations to impose on us, and nothing to stop them forcing no, us that, to no, pay said, more money. Sorry, I said if we remain. No, sorry, if we remain. There we are. Sorry, sorry. If we remain, um, there'll be nothing. So that is a bit of scaremongering from his side. Um, we had Boris um, writing in the Telegraph this week saying that we would be um, dragged willy nilly into a European super state if we stay. That's a bit of scaremongering. He also used, he said, if we, it's a bit like um, Richard's point about uh, regulations and everything, he said that 
that we would be like boiled frogs if we stayed. That's a bit of okay. scaremongering. <laughs> and other people, I give you the worst scaremongering. The worst scaremongering is that if we stay in the EU, um, these um, refugees, that what will happen is the jihadists will come to the EU posing as refugees. They will be sleepers. They'll get a passport in a country like Germany. They'll go on the ground for about 10 years because it takes a passport. It's about 10 years to get a passport in Germany. And then they'll come across to Britain and blow us up. If that's not scaremongering, I don't know what is scaremongering. Okay. What, I mean, are the campaigns <coughs> using the word scaremongering to attack the state campaign and actually themselves doing the same thing as we did yesterday? No, I don't think we are. I mean, uh, the Remain camp have been using Project Fear, and they've now turned Project Fear into Project Intimidate. So, uh, in the last three weeks, the Prime Minister has organised, uh, by his own um, acceptance, a number 10 to phone up uh, most of the CEOs of FTSE 100 companies and ask them to sign a letter. 36 did, and a number of other senior leaders. But if you're the chief exec of Heathrow Airport, who wants the government to give you a third runway, you're not going to decline to sign the letter, are you? You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So, um, and then, uh, but if there's a businessman such as John Longworth, who's the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, last week he clearly expressed that it was his personal view, not the, the company that he worked for, uh, that it was his personal view that Britain would be left for her. All of a sudden, he suspended and then forced to resign under pressure, it turns out, from number 10. So we turn Project Fear into Project Intimidate. There's one rule for them and another rule for those of us that want to leave. But I'm just going to come back to this point that Hugo raised earlier, which is, which is an interesting point about uh, Article 50 and what happens at the end of the two years. The reality is there are lots of countries around the world who don't have a free trade agreement with uh, the EU, and they still trade with it. It's called the World Trade Organization, which sits above the EU. Take Australia, for example. The average tariffs under the uh, WTO, I understand, are less than 3%. So it's not like we disappear into some black hole. And regrettably, on the Council of Ministers, we don't have any influence. It doesn't matter whether there's 9% or 13% of votes. We voted in the last 20 years uh, no to proposals in the Council of Ministers 72 times. And we've been ignored, despite being the second biggest economy, the second biggest contributor, we've been ignored every single time. We have no influence. My undergraduate year as well. I went to school here as well. So, 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 so I feel a bit more British by now than German. Uh, and, and I would like to comment on you know what the UK is doing doing sort of good before the EU. And I mean that's true, yeah. Thanks to Margaret Thatcher's strategy, deregulation, you know, the UK came out from the summers in the seventies and these kind of things. Yeah, but my undergraduate degree was in finance. And what we were always taught was the history is not always a good predictor for the past, uh, for, for, for the future. Um, well, but not the past either. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good point, keep going. And yeah, what, what, what I'm thinking, I mean, the world was very different back then than it's now. The, in the year 2000, nobody knew what an email is. But, and companies like Google or Facebook weren't even founded. Uh, and I mean, la, large portion of the UK's prosperity is built on the financial sector. And in contrast to like the manufacturing sector, the banking sector is very mobile. And aren't, aren't you afraid that you know if the UK leaves, a large proportion of these banks jump into a plane for 50 minutes in Frankfurt? Hello. <laughs> okay. Right, okay, mobile banking sector, good question. Yes. Um, I, I'm German as well, actually. Well, I wanted to just add to your point of like saying you were up and up and against. Um, I was a lecturer earlier this session about signing picks up ICM um, about the EU and about Brexit. And we determined it was by far the case in the future of the EU. It hasn't got to come to eBay. Most of us are against the council. It's way more often than many other countries, more often than the UK. Still, there's no one who, well, not enough many who want to leave in Germany. So, my question to others is well, A, that isn't necessarily a bad thing, and if so, what do you think? Subject up. Again. Yes. 
So I'm German as well. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my question actually concerns Scotland. Just, so because we've, we've started speaking, we haven't really spoken about Scotland at all, but I think the, the important question about Scotland, we shouldn't start speculating whether Scotland will stay in or whether they're going to have a referendum. I don't even think that's an important question. I think the important question, as well, like, like Richard, to answer is, why do you think that the Scottish, what do they see in the EU? If the EU is apparently so bad and creates all these regulations and problems, why should it actually be a cause for the Scottish to engage in another referendum if, uh, if, all these, if, it, if the EU just caused all these problems? So what do they see in it? Okay, that's amazing. I, I think, actually, no, thank you for reminding us about Scotland, because uh, it is an interesting point, um, and, uh, and I was up there recently. But the reality is that um, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, whatever one thinks of her, she is a fantastic politician doing a really good job for Scotland, which is what she's elected to do. And I'm convinced the last thing in this world she wants is a second referendum. Her job is to negotiate a great deal for Scotland, and she's doing it very well. What she's actually achieving is Devo max, max, max. They're achieving, they're almost achieving independence uh, without independence. Um, if she has a second referendum and win, and uh, sorry, and loses, that's it. It's gone forever. Gone forever. All her influence, all her uh, ability and her leverage, negotiating leverage, is gone. The reality is, if, if, if Scotland uh, voted for independence with the oil price where it is now, it would be bust within five years and going to a bailout either from the EU or from the IMF or from, uh, from us in Westminster. So I don't think there's any way the Scots uh, would vote uh, to leave. I don't think she'll call a referendum. And um, I think actually when we have this referendum, I think the Scottish vote will be much closer than uh, she is, is, is effectively scaling up. To ask a follow-up on that. Of okay. The follow-up is more like, so my question wasn't, what would happen, are they going to have a referendum, or what would happen if they would have one? The question is, why would that lead them, why would leaving the EU lead them to have a referendum? So it seems like they care about the EU, right? So they care about something that the EU gives them. Why do they do that? Why do they care if apparently the EU well, just regulates and costs them money? <clears throat> Again, um, lots of people listen to Nicola Sturgeon. If you listen to fishermen up and down the coast of Scotland, you know, they absolutely hate the EU and what it did to the fishing industry. You know, the British Isles, you know, we owned in 1971 or 72, 70% of all the fish in the waters of the European Union. We're only allowed to fish now about 15%. Can, can, I, can I just ask, just ask the audience, it'd be just interesting to know, can you put up your hands if you have a right to vote on June the 23rd? Just so we, oh, lots, 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 fantastic, wonderful. Um, so, um, Your evening was very great. good. So, the second, so no, it's not the second. So, it's about the Scots. Um, I mean, my, my sense is that they appreciate the freedom that you get, um, the four freedoms um, of being free movement of people, goods, services, capital, but probably free movement of people within a, a continent of 500 million people. Secondly, they're not so worried about being bossed around by Brussels because they feel they're being bossed around by Westminster. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is because we talked about how much influence do we really have in the European Council, and Richard said we don't have any, and then I think somebody said he was with Simon Hicks, who's a professor here, um, who's, who has crunched the numbers. It's true that we've been outvoted more than any other council, country, but we were still on the winning side 87% that's not really the issue. I mean, that is an issue, it makes some sense, not too bad, but, but, but what's really the issue is, are we getting proposals that we care about? And this is something that requires a lot of deep research, and Hicks has actually crunched the numbers, and I'm reading. Um, comparing what each country wants to happen in a negotiation with what actually happens, the UK is the fourth most successful country in the EU. If you look just at the issues that it is the second most successful. So the idea that we have no influence is a myth. Right, come back to that. You don't want to respond immediately. Let's take another round of questions. Have another one. <laughs> well, we've got a serious question. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> it never occurred to me that you um, have First of all, um, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have to say this, but well, your opening statement, which is what you said, was probably the most and you know, sort of the most chauvinistic and nationalist thing that a person has ever said that was in a movie. And now my question is to you. 
Um, in the entire uh, debate um, in, uh, on, the, on the pro EU side, um, uh, that the, the, the pro EU side of the debate also um, only engages in this um, uh, in this discourse of what is uh, what is the best deal for us, for us Britons, what are our economic benefits if we stay in the EU? What are yeah, what are the economic benefits? There is no talk whatsoever about any. Um, sort of um, an idea of Europe as a unified con uh, continent, or like, I don't know any sort of pathos for for the future. Um, why not? Why why is the pro campaign so effective? Our question reached the speakers okay, and I saw another couple of hands. Yes, here. Yeah, another question for Richard. Um, would you accept that any deal that the UK Grant the UK the same benefits that uh, that it has now uh, under a new a new deal, right? Okay, all right. Well, let's start with you. Uh, I'll come back. Okay, is it on this? So no, it's all right. Okay, well, I'll come back to you because we'll take one more round, then we'll sort of run run up to the end, and I'll take another vote. So that would be Richard. Um, I think overall, uh, on a balanced basis, I think we can do as good or better. We will be sovereign, we will be a free country again, as opposed to being 10% of the EU. I just want to pick up the point about the risks. There's always risks in life, there's risks in business, as, as you all know. Um, we live in a globalised world, we can't ignore that. And uh, you know, we are a very, you know, we're in a very competitive global economy. But the real proof is in the pudding. We talk about banks leaving. HSBC, after a two, I think it was a two year study, has just in the last four weeks, decided to retain its headquarters, its global headquarters in London. It could have very easily deferred that decision six months, and if we voted to leave, said, I'm off, we're over, it doesn't matter. But they didn't. They chose to remain here in the full knowledge that there is a serious prospect that we will leave the EU, because actually the benefits of being in London far, far outweigh anything to do with this Brexit debate. So the proof is in the pudding. The banks will not leave. And they threatened that in 97, 98, when they said we had to join the euro, and nobody left. What about the point, which was sort of aimed in a slightly different way at both of you, about aiming, I mean, coming up with a very narrow interpretation either of Britain's interest or well, Britain's <coughs> interest in the world, is it? Are you coming up with a sort of both of you, just, you know, aimed at in a different way? Um, sort of narrow, self interested Britain view of the world. No, not at all. I, I said it very clearly. Um, we, we want to be uh, outward-facing globalists. You know, there, that is where the opportunities lie. You know, the fastest-growing markets are not in the EU; they're all over the world. That's where we need to be facing. You know, our exports to the rest of the world are growing uh, significantly, whereas our exports to the EU are flatlining to less than they were nine years ago. And it's true, Hugo. We haven't exactly put forward this pretty wonderful future of Europe as an ideal, which is how it all began. So I think it's important that you, 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 you can talk about practical things, um, not come up with highfalutin ideals. I think also you have to admit that the EU is not in great shape. The Eurozone in particular is not in good shape. The Schengen area is not in good shape. We are fortunate not enough not to be in either of those. However, I have tried to say that actually um, there is a huge opportunity for Britain if we stay in the EU to be a leader both in the single market and, which is economic, but and in foreign policy, which is not economic. And um, to use a leadership position in both of those areas to be an even stronger leader in the world. So I do feel quite passionately that there's a big upside for being in, but I think that it's only fair to warn that there is a downside if we leave. Okay. Right, we'll take one more round, then I'll take it. Uh, yes, Linda, I'll come back to you because you have a question. The gentleman at the back, and then you, you have one to say. So, yeah, the gentleman at the back. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, a former president of this society about two, three years ago, uh, and I'm a training lawyer in the city of London. 
And just a comment on, on this debate. Firstly, it's very interesting. But I'm concerned that the national debate about the most important issue in our country's recent history is becoming a squabble over facts. It's a squabble over, it's a squabble over interpretation, and it's just one camp fighting uh, the other camp saying that there are just mistruths being told. To what extent do you think this debate is ultimately going to be won by marketing and getting the message across? Or what extent do you think principle will ultimately prevail? <laughs> just, just missed the last point, that the principle of uh, ultimately prevail. The principle of what? Or principle in general? Uh, principle, 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 principle in general. general. Okay, right. Cool. Uh, and then, and two, repeat the question, so please. Yeah, I, I wanted to um, bring up this idea that the European Union doesn't work for us. A lot of people talk about fisheries as an example. And although that can be just considered a natural transition of our economy, people say that the European Union has stifled our fisheries. So I think in the European Union we have a committee of fisheries, a fishery committee. And the only legal representative is, or has been for the last decade, is to Nigel Farage. And <laughs> 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 I think if you if you uh, you count the number of times yeah. If you count the number of times he's turned up, I think it's possibly on your right hand in the last ten years. So I think maybe the problem with the European Union, for us at least, is that we're not invested enough in it. I mean, our turnout is in the 20, is in the 20 percentage. That's why we elect people like populists and we elect people second-rate politicians. So maybe we need to kind of invest more. We need to know who our MPs are. We need to hold them to account more. So you make sure they show up for meetings. We need to make sure they're not just claiming their salaries and not doing anything. Why, uh, okay, but why do you think, given the, I'm just not the chair team, Clearly, we, you know, this is obviously a, a, a politically interested audience, but there are clearly strong views about issues related to politics, immigration in particular. So, why do you think that nevertheless the turnout and you know, the public interest is lower than it is for even local elections, if you have elections out on their own? All right, you just have to get a guess. And that's all you know. uh, yeah. If I knew that, I'd be a lot smarter than I have. I don't know, you'd all be a lot smarter than I have. But none of us know. Okay, and there was one additional question. Yeah. Somebody had another question. No? All right. Okay, well, look, um, let's take those two points, really. Uh, the, the precise point about, you know, have we just not grasped the EU enough uh, to make it work? And second, uh, the question about um, everybody fighting with hypotheticals, really. You're, you're saying that nobody's got real facts, but nobody can tell what the facts are, all the facts are lost, I hide, uh, summarize your question, and that in the end everybody just fights on hypotheticals, and the remarkable people then win. Thank you. That's the <laughs> answer of the current. Now, um, <coughs> this is going to be our last, uh, Hugo, go on. Okay, um, I think, I think that after the referendum, one of the, the reasons for pe feeling positive is that if we vote to remain, we may become more engaged in the process. Over the last five years, certainly under Cameron, six years, um, he's not been able to be engaged. He's been so worried he'd done anything positive, his Eurosceptics would follow him. Um, but I think it's also true to say that at the level of the people, a lot of people are not engaged because there isn't what we would call a European demos. Now, there may be in a generation or two, maybe your generation will be part of a European European, but um, most people don't feel European, so the emotional connection is not yet there. It can develop over time. You know, if you go back a, you know, a, a, a century, most Italians didn't feel Italian. They felt Sicilian or Tuscan or whatever it is, but over a century they've become to feel um, it, 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 Italian. And, um, and as you get people traveling around into Marion, Gulf and Cook and whatever, blah, 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 that will, will help. The second thing is that um, facts. I think that facts are not the only thing here, clearly. Um, because if you agreed on the facts, you still might come to a different view of what's best for Britain. But I do think it's important to get the facts right. And I've corrected Richard on a number of his errors. I haven't had time to correct him on all of them. Because if I had more, <laughs> I didn't manage to get around to. But he hasn't corrected me on any single thing. So it's not a squabble, it's, 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 not, it's not both of us going after each other for getting the facts wrong, it's me actually pointing out his errors. What about the marketing? 
marketing will decide it. I think marketing will play a role. I think marketing. I think marketing will play a role. I think I think marketing. I think facts should play a role. I think marketing, unfortunately, will play and spin will play a, a very big role. Um, my aim with my new venture is to make sure that facts play as big a role as possible, and then when people have got the facts, let them make up their minds on the basis of how they judge what they want, as informed as possible. Great. So I obviously don't accept the facts are wrong. I mean, uh, Hugo talks about the facts, um, but it was the one about the 44% of exports. That's the gross number before you strip out the Antwerp Rotterdam effect. In a sense there, actually the truth is we're both right. I think, picking up, I mean, the reality of politics is you've got a combination of facts, and yet then you've got leadership and how you convince people. And, and that is the nature of politics, and I just don't think you can get away from that. I, I do. I think the, the issue that uh, we're all learning on both counts is that sadly, not enough people around the country know enough about what the European Union does, what works, and what doesn't work. And I think that is that's an issue probably just for all leaders um, uh, on both camps and historically. Um, so I think that's the, the point about um, principle comes through. Um, uh, there was another.
uh, you should definitely therefore take one because if, if you're on one side and you're guy from your the other side of the argument from your side, it can reinforce your position. Thank you. Thank you to both our speakers who have argued their cases.